The King James says that his miracles manifested forth his glory. No, his miracles, every one of them manifested forth his doxa in Greek, his judgments. Every miracle he performed, from the defiling of the Pharisees' stone water pots to the making of mud from spit and dust on the Sabbath day to commanding a layman to carry his bedroll on the Sabbath, every one of his miracles violated rules of rabbinic Phariseeism. The third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. The third day of the week is Yom Shlishi. This is the day after Yeshua met Netanel in Beit Seda. It is now Tuesday, April 1st, 27 of the Common Era. It is the fourth day of the first month, 10 days before Passover. There was a marriage in Cana about a half day's walk from Beit Seda. On the third day, Yom Shlishi, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and Miriam, the mother of Yeshua, was there. And Yeshua and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. Weddings were planned a year in advance, and Yeshua would have been invited to the wedding months earlier. It has been nearly two months since he left his home in Netzeret for his mikveh in the Yarden. They ran out of wine, so the mother of Yeshua said to him, they have no more wine. Yeshua said to her, my lady, why should this be a concern of mine? It is not yet my time. Yeshua's mother is in a position of responsibility at this wedding, and the servants are at her command. When she informs Yeshua that they've run out of wine, he responds to her in respect of her official capacity. Not as the King James Version reads, woman, what have I to do with you? My hour is not yet come. No, Yeshua is not barking at his mother. He said, my lady, and then he reminds her that according to ancient Israeli wedding custom, he is ranked lower on the guest list and is not among those who are expected to provide wine for the wedding. We are not privy to their continued conversation, but I can imagine. Okay, mother, I'll provide some wine, but I'll do it my way. Yeshua, please don't mess with the rabbis tonight, please. Mother, I wouldn't need to do this if others had taken their responsibilities seriously. Just tell the servants to do as I tell them, and all will be well, if they can keep their mouths shut. Finally, Miriam turns to the servants. Whatever he tells you, do it. Now, there were six stone water pots for the purifying of the Jews. Each pot held about two or three liters apiece. The inclusion of stone water pots tells us that this was a Pharisee wedding, and the master of ceremonies is the head rabbi of their synagogue. These six stone water pots were used for a Pharisee purification ritual, which is never mentioned in the Torah, but is meticulously detailed in the ancient Talmudic writings of the Pharisee sages. Water is usually carried from the well in a wine skin or ceramic pot. If the container had been used for wine in the past, the flavor of grapes could still be present. But if water has the slightest taste of wine or vinegar, it is deemed to be ceremonially unclean for a Pharisee wedding and cannot be used unless the water is sanctified according to ritual. According to rabbinic law, Stone cannot contract ritual impurity. So wine-tainted water must be put in a stone vessel that is to be filled to the very brim. The stone water pot is then lowered into the waters of a mikvah, and as soon as the waters of the mikvah kiss the water at the brim of the stone water pot, it is brought up from the mikvah, sanctified. So, Yeshua said to the servants, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He then told them, now draw out of the water pot and give it to the master of ceremonies. This they did, but they did not mikvah the water. 
When the master of the feast tasted the water, which was turned into wine, he did not know where it came from. But the servants which drew the water knew. As long as the servants kept their mouth shut, there would be no problem. But if the rabbi finds out that Yeshua had deliberately defiled his ceremonial stone water pot with the best Cabernet Sauvignon in the entire Jezreel Valley, he would have turned the tables upside down. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said, at the beginning of the feast, everyone sets forth the choicest wine, and after men have well drunk, then they bring out that which is inferior. But you have kept the most excellent wine until now. I have no doubt that within minutes, the rabbi found out where the wine was coming from, and he would have gone Meshugana. That is the reason that verse 11 says, this miracle at the wedding in Cain of Galilee is the first of many miracles Yeshua performed, which openly declared his righteous judgments. The King James says that his miracles manifested forth his glory. No, his miracles, every one of them manifested forth his doxa in Greek, his judgments. Every miracle he performed, from the defiling of the Pharisees' stone water pots to the making of mud from spit and dust on the Sabbath day to commanding a layman to carry his bedroll on the Sabbath, every one of his miracles violated rules of rabbinic Phariseeism. Every miracle, every miracle was a judgment against the made-up rules of a religious system that claimed to follow Moses, but invented any commandments that they could get others to follow and subtracted any God-given commandments that they didn't want to follow. His disciples understood, and they believed him. Shalom, Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon, and I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new michaelrood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.